and uh, I really want to encourage you. Well, let's pray first, and I'll introduce us a little bit. Father, we do need your help. God, we recognize that without you, we can do nothing, and that is so literal. We certainly could not win souls without you, and we could not win souls. We would not win souls if we didn't have you. We wouldn't have a reason. So I pray that you just help us with our purpose and our mindset to be effective in reaching the lost for Jesus. And God, I pray that you would just help us to be very, very practical about how we reach the lost. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, last week, last week we had an introduction. I'd like to just kind of blast through, if you don't mind, some of our notes in case you were not here. Uh, I had a conversation with Tony, but I don't know for sure if he has, if he has the uh, video from last week up. But I hope that he does and that he will. And I just want to, I guess, ask you a question. This is, this is, of course, I put this up because this is art. And no, not literally. That's not the name of it. This is this is actually art, like artistic. Art link later. And this is what soul winners look like. That's what we learned last week. And uh, Angela counted the hairs on the woman's head. She said there were five, but I'm looking at it, and there's six. So she was wrong about that. Well, this, the one's going out. Out. this is it. Which out? person does that belong to? It's the girl's what? eyebrow. This. <laughs> <laughs> This doesn't belong to the girl. This is from the woman. I don't know why you guys can't tell from the actual fall of it. Uh, this is modern art because it, it uh, was created last week. And I'll, I just put this up here kind of as a shameless self-promotion. Uh, if anyone wants to buy a printed copy of this, I'll autograph it. You know, so oh, we can make posters. Yeah, you, we could, we could really. This could be big. This could, this could be eBay. billboards. I would rather see this than the garbage that's on the billboards on I ninety five. And so this would also help people that are confused about gender and things like that. You know, yeah. man, boy, can they <laughs> so a lot of definition there. So uh, the reality of it uh, is that the the point of what we learned last week is that a soul winner is not a person that has a mold or a particular look. You know, it's not a... I remember when I was in college, I had roommates, and you know, if you don't get another perspective a lot of times until you meet people that are different than you. I had some roommates that were... I guess they were former potheads. I don't know how else to put it. That was kind of what they were. And uh, they, were, they were saved, and they had... They were different, but their perspective in life was just very different than mine was. And one of the guys that, well, they got in trouble in their room, and I got moved into their room. I had to be their roommate because they, they needed somebody to be in their room that would keep them from getting kicked out of school, I think. So anyway, they used to make fun of me all the time. I was a ministerial major, and they would make fun of me because I parted my hair. Now... I didn't part my hair because I was a ministerial major. I parted my hair because that's what everybody in Kansas did. I mean, it's just, you know, if you combed your hair, you, you parted it on a side. Honestly, I can't really part my hair. I have so many cowlicks that my hair does whatever it wants to on any given day. And so I try to part my hair, whatever. It's, I never really thought about my hair. You know, I think a guy that's really a man doesn't spend a lot of time looking in a mirror, doesn't spend a lot of time thinking about what he looks like. You know, he just, you know, does things that, you know, change the world, not worry about how his hair looks, you know. So, <laughs> anyway, but they used to be like, why don't you just spike your hair sometime? Come on, just spike your hair. And I'm like, I just think people with spiked hair look stupid. I, you know, they're like, well, it's just because you're a ministerial major. Whereas they thought that because I was a pastoral ministries major that I parted my hair. The reason I parted my hair is just because it's what I'd always done. And I think in the Christian school that I went to, if I'd had any extreme hairstyle, I'd probably they would have corrected that. You know, pastor would have taken us downstairs and given us a buzz cut or something, you know. <laughs> so, you know, you just had to have your hair off your ears and, you know, above your collar on your neck. And, and uh, our principal would holler at you if your hair was not within spec. So it was really cut your hair. I never thought about the hairstyle. But, you know, some people think about soul winning or soul winners like there's a style to them, like there's a certain look. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. You know, they think that, you know, you're going to look kind of like a pastor or you're going to uh, dress a certain way. No, a soul winner looks like the person that you see in the mirror each day. 
and they have your personality type. They're you. Yeah, you don't have to, uh, unless it's sinful, what you are and the way you behave, you don't have to become something different in order to be a soul winner. You're, you're the person God made you to be, and you are uniquely qualified to win people the way that you are. And you and your personality, we'll go through a little bit of that today, but I want to encourage you today, I want to do some discussion. So if you have some questions, this is the day that we can be just really flexible. We can, uh, we can go off on tangents if they're important to you. In other words, if there's something that you say, you know, I need some clarification or I need an answer about this. So we saw this last week uh, in, our, in our first week. We saw the qualifications. Uh-oh. Oh, yes. We saw, saw the qualifications last week for being a soul winner. And i got to correct this, my, my view here. Well, it doesn't matter. Uh, well, is that you, in order to be a soul winner, you have to be saved. Lee kind of fixed at the end of our, of our time last week. He said, you know what? You see, I said saved and called. He said, you know, really just being saved. And you're called because you're saved. So in, in, you, if you ask the question, am I supposed to be a soul winner? The answer is, are you saved? If you're, say, if you're not saved, then you might not be a soul winner. Pastor Rob Redland, though, was here this last weekend, and he told about a story in the church he was interim pastoring in. And he was talking about the fresh perspective that you have when you're not from there. You know, you kind of can... <clears throat> because because you're, you haven't been there a long time, if something's wrong with somebody... Uh, or something's wrong in their lives, you can kind of address things in a way that, you know, a person who's always there really can't get away with. But he had a deacon. They had 11 deacons in their church, pretty large church, I think about 500 or so. And a deacon in the church called him in, aside for, you know, a private conversation. And he said, Pastor, i got to tell you something. He said, it's real embarrassing. Uh, but he said, and I think he was in his 50s or 60s. And he said, Basically, the, the, the long and short of it is that he said, I've never been saved. I've never, I'd never been saved before. And he called Pastor Redland's brother and just told him, you know what, i just being honest, I've never been saved. He's a deacon in an independent Baptist church, and he's pretty far along in life. And it's not a church where they try to make you question your salvation, try to convince people of, you know, that, that they're not really saved. But he just had never been saved. And, you know, the question is, had he ever won the lost? Had he ever won souls? Well... From all accounts, he'd won his family. <laughs> in other words, the guy led people to Christ. He was not even born again. Okay, how do you account for that? Well, read Philippians chapter 1 sometime, where Paul talks about individuals that preach Christ out of envy and strife and out of contention mm -hmm. and supposing to add affliction to his bonds. And it's possible to share the gospel with somebody and not even be saved. It is possible. Let me ask you a question. Who's going to be a more effective soul winner, a saved person or a lost person? Safe person. A safe person every time. So I, we're not going to debate nuances. A lot of Christians are confused about uh, ministries uh, that just seem like they're extremely worldly. It seem like they use the world's methods. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says we're not to love the world, neither the things that are in the world. And then that, the answer is always like, well, they're reaching people. People are getting saved. Well, the answer to that question is, well, God knows about it, but it, there's the way that God wants us to do it. And... God's just really merciful, isn't He? Mm -hmm. God just saves people in spite of people sometimes. And I don't want to be the kind of soul winner that people aren't saved in spite of me. I have so many Christian friends. Uh, my, my pastor, Pastor McClure in Delray Beach, you know, one of the things that he said happened to him when he got saved as a teenager was he went to share the gospel with one of his friends. And his friend said, I've, already, I've been saved for years. And he said, why didn't you tell me? How could you have been saved and not told me? I don't know how many countless people I know that when they got saved and were so excited went to tell their friends, their friends said, I didn't know that. I'm, I'm born again. And they, they, their response is, I could have gone to hell. And you never told me. You know, why didn't you share the gospel with me? And that's really what we're targeting because truth be told, uh, we don't know how many people would be saved if we were everything we should be at, as soul winners. And that's, the, that's one of the purposes and goals. Okay. And so there's our uh, never misunderestimate what people will do in order to justify themselves by their works. They'll even go soul winning. So, do you know, there are people that will go soul winning and not even be saved. And that's the point I wanted to make. But that's not what we want to do. We don't just want to go do something because it's a work. We want to be effective in our soul winning. That's just being funny. That's George W. And that's, that's a word he coined. 
misunderestimate. It's one of my favorite words. Okay, you need to have assurance of your salvation. You need to study the simplicity of the gospel and the promises for eternal life. Uh, this is last week's, of course. And what I want to emphasize is that we need to be very, very simple in our understanding of the gospel and in our presentation of the gospel. So don't, don't, uh, don't share the gospel from all over the Bible. I like the Romans Road, but I use it less and less. Mostly what I use from the Romans Road are verses that talk about sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And those verses are within their context. But when I share the gospel, I use John 3 and I just tell the story of Nicodemus. Okay? So memorize John 3. Uh, then these are so, some important scriptures that are Christ's command. So if we're saved and if we're called, the question is, are we effective soul winners? And if we're not, what's missing? Well, uh, we don't need anything in order to be effective soul winners. Uh, there's nothing that we need to have uh, that we cannot have. What we need is to be everything God wants us to be. And effectively, being a soul winner means to be filled with God's Spirit. And uh, I, I want to just kind of jump out of this. This is last week's presentation. I want to close this one, jump out of it, and uh, go into this week's presentation. So uh, if you'll permit me, I'm sorry. I, that isn't how I intended to do that. But everything will be fine. Uh -oh. Is that loading? No, I, I think it is. I just have to make sure everything's here. For what, whatever reason, I have an extra presentation. So something's not here that ought to be. Okay, so we want to talk about... Um, oh, this is some more art. I don't think this is what's supposed to be starting. Here we go. That's where we begin today. All right, so soul winning satur saturation. What I want to talk about today is the attitude, the right attitude to be an effective soul winner. And that's really the important thing. Uh, here's an effective soul winner. Um, <laughs> this is the, so does that mean I'm going to see you in church on Sunday face? All right, uh, you have to watch the video. <laughs> There's some clip art that I use to reference in order to make uh, a Bible. In case you don't know what this is, I labeled everything in my art. So this is a Bible, that's a person. And to qualify, that's a soul winning person. So, just so you guys know what a soul winner looks like, we're talking. What's that? He's got teeth. I put teeth on this guy. Okay, so. One hair. What's that? One hair. No, not prison person. Yeah, uh, I was in a hurry. All right. Go to, if you will, in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That was your homework you were supposed to read. How many of y'all read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 in preparation for class today? Everybody's looking at me like I'm from outer space. Okay. I want to begin reading in verse 11. It's on the, on the slide, but you may want to just jot down notes in your Bible. Uh, every Christian really ought to be pretty familiar at, uh, with 1 Corinthians chapter 12 because in it are a lot of purpose statements about the church and primarily about spiritual gifts. I'm just going to begin reading down in verse 11. That isn't where our context begins. And, of course, there's a, a greater context to it, and I, we don't have time to discuss it, but I want to read it today because this is an important passage of Scripture. Uh, but all these worketh, verse 11, that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Now understand, the word that we're looking at here is diversity. In other words, God's made us all different, but He's made us all part of a body with the same purpose. Uh, if the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Listen, just because you're not pastor doesn't mean you're not a soul winner. Just because uh, you're not a pastor's wife doesn't mean you're not a soul winner. Just because you're not a deacon doesn't mean you're not a soul winner. Just because 
uh, you're, you're, you're a blue collar guy or a white collar guy or a, a blue collar lady or a stay at home mom or uh, whatever it is that, that would be your identity as far as your occupation and your preferences and th that involves a lot of your personalities and so forth. That has nothing to do. It, just because you're not an ear and you're a hand doesn't mean that the hand's not a soul winner. Or because you're an ear and not an eye. Or because of whatever. So go down to verse 18. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body. Notice that next phrase in verse 18. As it hath pleased him. Stop here for just a minute. This is a life help, but this is also a soul winning help. One of the best things you can do is to realize God made you. Perfectly. God made you. Perfectly. In other words, you couldn't be different and be better. If you were different, you'd be worse. And God made you perfectly, ultimately, to be a soul winner. So when you look and you say, you know, Pastor, you know, I'm just not a really good speaker, or I'm shy, or I'm whatever it is, remember this, God made you as it pleased Him. That's pretty neat, isn't it? Think on that. Meditate on that sometime. In other words, if your purpose in life ultimately is to glorify Christ and the way that you're actively supposed to carry out His will is to preach the gospel, like we saw last week, <clears throat> you're perfect for the task. You're perfect for the task. And I, I get frustrated sometimes when people say, Pastor, I need you to come talk to this person. And I'm thinking, that's your person. I can't talk to them as well as you can. Oh, no, Pastor. Now, if they got questions or answers, you know, let's all get together. But I want you to be there because you're their friend. And you're the person that God has given the inroad. I don't know how many times I've gone to people that are just not open to me. And they're open to the person who's sharing the gospel with them. And the person sharing the gospel like, oh, I'm inadequate for this. You know, I'm not, whatever. No, 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 no. You're perfect for reaching the people that surround you. You're the person that God put in the place and, and equipped you and made you. Again, we're not talking about if there's sin in your life. Listen, if there's sin in your life, then, then work on spiritual victory. And that's the focus that you need to have. And part of that will be, the, the process of being filled with the Spirit. That'll, that'll not only empower you to preach the gospel, but it'll also empower you to have spiritual victory. It'll be uh, two things. So, verse 19, and if they were all one member, where were the body? Can you imagine a hand walking around? A foot walking around? You know, they're, you know this is sort of like a, uh, a um, 1980s or 90s cartoon, you know, like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, where you have the, you know, what's the brain? Crane? You know, and he's, he, he's a person, but he's just a brain with little wigglies on the side of his brain. And he's got to have a robot to move around him because he doesn't have a body. He's just a brain, you know. Uh, the reality of it is is that we're not, the body isn't one dimensional, but you're a dimension of the body. And your dimension of the body is important. Verse 20, but now are they many members, yet one body. And the eye, okay, and, and now stop, notice that, that phrase, one body. The task of soul winning ultimately is not only through the church, but it's a task which overall is given to the church. So it's a corporate task. It's a, it's a job that we do together, that we perform together, but you've got to execute your part of the task or the church won't be effective. And now, and the eye can, so verse 21, the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. What's bothersome, isn't it, when somebody says, you know, Pastor, I'd like to be involved with that, and somebody's like, you know, you're not really the right kind of person. To be. No, you are the right kind of person to be involved with, with the soul-winning ministry. Well, I'm more of a, you know, I'm more of the behind-the-scenes guy. I clean toilets. You know, well, toilets need to be cleaned. But toilets don't get saved. Now, I understand cleaning toilets can create an environment for people to get saved. I'm, I'm not talking, I'm not undermining the importance of service. But service is not the same as soul winning. And a lot of people, they choose service and they say that's my part of soul winning. No, 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 no. No, no, no. You're uniquely equipped to reach people. And it's, it's you don't need to be different than what you are in order to do it. Uh, verse 22, uh, nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Please stop here. Let me share my heart with you. <clears throat> I cannot win people as well as you can. 
Do you listen to me? I cannot win people as well as you can. Now, I may win more people than you do, but it's because of you that I win people normally. That's just a fact. Uh, last night, 11 o'clock, Yuri. You guys know Yuri that got saved in Miami Beach last year? His mom lives in Atlanta. Last night, 11 o'clock, she, well, she, she called and said, can I come by? Come by your house. She came. She's a Christian. She's been praying for her son for years and years and years. Last year, uh, he was in a crisis, and he and his wife came to church in Miami Beach, and during Sunday school hour, I sat down with them. And, you know, ultimately, that next day, Monday, I met with them again, and Yuri, who was an, had, who was an atheist, got saved last year. And we've seen him grow. He was in church last Sunday morning, sitting in the back row over here. He lives in Atlanta, but he tries to come down and, and so forth. And, and uh, you know, his mom's just thrilled to death. You know, and she just thinks Pastor Price is the most wonderful person in the world because her atheist son that she's prayed for for years got saved. The only reason I got to lead Yuri to the Lord is because I'm the guy with the cell phone that answers for Miami Beach. And I'm the face when somebody comes in that people see. But I'm not the one that won Yuri. I'm not the one that planted and watered. God gave the increase. I was just a part of it. And, and so it's... You know, sometimes pastor gets to be the person that leads someone to Christ, but he's not the person that established a relationship and laid a foundation and did all of these things. Uh, it's you. You're the person. And I can't win anyone if you won't reach your friends. Whereas I can only reach my... I have friends and neighbors I'm, that I'm praying for right now and I'm working on reaching, establishing relationships and sharing the gospel with and so forth. And it's a process. And I might be the one that leads them to Christ or I might not be, but they're my neighbors, they're my people that I'm reaching. I have people I come into contact with that I'm sharing the gospel with. And they're my people. They're the ones I'm reaching. But you have yours. And if you reach your people, yes, of course pastor can help. Of course, being part of the body, I mean, you bring them into the body, and doesn't the Holy Spirit do more in a place where that's filled with His Spirit? And doesn't, doesn't a, a special event or activity at church, isn't it great how you getting to share your testimony with the brethren in a place like that will open up a private conversation maybe when you get home? Or just things work. The, the, church, the church is the body. That's where we do the soul winning through. But the hand, the foot, the eye, the ear, the nose... They're all important to doing the work of soul winning. And you're a hand, foot, eye, ear, nose, or toe, or something. Uh, so maybe you're a wart on somebody's foot. But whatever you... Okay. <laughs> Verse 23. Those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. Think on that. For our comely parts have no need. But God hath tempered the body together, having given... <laughs> given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. You know, when it comes to beauty, we tend to admire the less functional parts of the body. More than we do the functional parts, right? Uh, that's the point of what the Scripture is saying. And then verse 25, that there should be no schism in the body. Schisms of separation or division. But that members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, verse 27 really summarizes well. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. Now that word particular is an idiosyncratic word. In other words, it's talking about your person. You in particular are a member of the body. Now stop here just for a second. Let me ask you a practical question. If the scripture emphasizes the work of the body so much, how important is the church in soul winning? I know people say, you know, I'm winning my friend, but I'm not going to bring him to church because I just don't, I think church is a put off. I don't really think church will, you know what? If you win your friend, that's your convert. They'll never be part of the church. And the church is Christ's body. The church is Christ's plan. Mm -hmm. Soul winning is to be a function of the body of Christ. There are people that say, Pastor, I don't really participate in the church's soul winning. You know, I do my own thing. I do my own soul winning. Well, that's one-dimensional. And soul winning is supposed to be multi-dimensional. You see that? In other words, it needs to be the hands, the feet, the finger, the toes, the eyes, the ears, the nose. Soul winning is multi-dimensional. 
And one of the reasons many believers are not effective in soul winning is they're one-dimensional soul winners. They're going off on their own trying to do something without doing it with the church. And the church is Christ's body and it's his plan. I've said so many times uh, that I get tired of hearing myself say it, but I say it so many times that the church is Jesus' idea. It was Jesus' idea. He founded her. He established her. He gave himself for her. He loves her. And you won't come up with a better plan than what Jesus planned. And you certainly cannot be more effective your way than you can be his way. Again, I'm not saying a person can't win a, a, a someone to Christ without you know, it being through the church. I'm just saying God's plan is to do it through the church. So work the plan. The plan works. All right? Uh, what are the types of soul winners? This kind of takes us back. We'll have a little bit of fun here. Types of soul winners. Boy, that, that is not very good font again. That, if you can't read it, says 7.7 .7 billion. The current world population is 7.7 .7 billion. Last census was something like six, right at 6 billion. In the last couple of years, we, the world's grown by more than a billion people. Right now, current population of the world is 7.7 .7 billion. It will probably be 8 billion people by the end of 2019. You can't even wrap your mind around how fast the world is exploding population-wise. Uh, you know, people, are the, this, I like to throw this out, the anti-vaccination people. And if you're anti-vaccination, I'm picking on you right now, so just understand that. Uh, you know, the anti-vaccination people uh, don't understand that what has prevent the, prevented the world's population is not just abortion, but what has prevented the world's population is plagues that wipe out populations of people. You know, the world wars were affected. World War I was affected as much by plagues as it was by military might. I literally, as more people died because of sickness, more, more armies were destroyed because of people dying because of sickness than actually died in, in combat. You know, and the fact of the matter is that you can't preserve life by health care, but... People are healthy than, healthier than they've ever been. They're living longer than they ever have, and they're reproducing more than they ever have, and the world's population is exploding. Until we come up with some new sickness that doesn't have a cure, uh, we're not going to be able to curtail or curb this population growth. The point is, is that God loves souls, and there are more souls than there ever have been before. And if you were going to try to figure out your personality type, we had a little fun last week by uploading a little card that you couldn't read of the 16 personality types. And the fact of the matter is you're not one of 16, you're actually one of 7.7 something billion. That's the, listen, embrace your personality. There's nobody like you and there's no one who has been made to do what God made you to do. Do you hear me? When the Bible says that God made us perfectly, we're perfectly, we're made as it pleased Him. You're made as it pleased God as one in 7.7 .7 billion people to do something that only one in 7.7 .7 billion people can do. That's how unique and how specially optimized God has made you in order to be a soul winner. That's incredible, isn't it? I'm not making that up. That's what God's Word says. That's what God's Word is. You study the Scripture, and that's what you're made to be. You know, so don't try to classify yourself. I'm one of all these people, you know, so these people could do. No, you're one. You're the only one like you. And you're the only one that can do what you're called to do and what your purpose is in life. You're special. Uh, you're a special type of soul winner. Uh, this is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. It begins by talking about the gifts that God gives to the church, the apostles and prophets. And, and here's a low-resolution bit of uh, a hijacked clip art from off the web. And I just want to just, I want to look at that phrase, fitly joined together. Uh, this is when God's talking about God gave gifts to the church, and He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come together in the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, and of the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, uh, with every wind and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. This is a church purpose statement similar to 1 Corinthians 12. And I want to get to verse 16. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in him in all things, which is the head, 
even Christ. Now notice verse 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Let's stop there. Anybody uh, enjoy uh, how, like, Jenga fit? You ever look at, like, the Jenga bricks, you know, three, 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 whatever. And, you know, you can take, if you play a game of Jenga where you pull the little pieces of wood out and stack them on top of each other, man, that, that thing can get pretty big. But when you put it all together, it fits down into a little compact box, doesn't it? It's, it's really maximized. It's, it's, it's as tight as it can be. Well, the Bible says that God has made us as the body fitly joined together. And Ephesians describes the church with the foundation of Christ the cornerstone, the apostles and the prophets, as the foundation of the church. But then it describes us as members of the body, members of peace a part of the body. And so if you think of it this way, you know, how many people are good at the, you know, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the doors and see all the people thing, you know. And uh, <laughs> the reality of it is, is that, oh, there goes the batteries to that. Um, you can't do church and steeple and carry the little thing <laughs> at the same time. We learn a lot of things every day. Uh, the reality of it is that the church is made up of members who are specific pieces. Can you imagine if we took a bunch of windows and tried to build a building? Or if we took you know, a bunch of doors and tried to build a building? Or a bunch of trim work and you can look around and look at the parts. You know, for a building to come together, it has a lot of different pieces that are uniquely fitted together. We went back one, huh? Okay, so well, let's go back here. So I want to look at this phrase here, fitly joined. And what, what kind of a person is this? What's this guy? We're, we're kind of talking about occupations. What this cute little fella here, what, what kind of person is he? Charlie. This handy is Charlie? Man. Handyman. <laughs> okay, so, so he's probably a handyman. What does he have here? He's got some tools, right? He's got a little toolbox. Looks like a paintbrush here, a wrench, Mr. a Mr. hammer, a shovel, and a rake, and a ladder. And he's got his handy-dandy uh, coveralls and steel-toed work boots and his work hat. And uh, he's a special kind of a person, and he does a special kind of a task, right? That's what he does. But you know what that person really is, if he's saved, is he's a soul winner. In other words, he's, that's just that's what he does, and that's the, those are the, because of what he does, he comes into contact with certain people, and he has certain things in common. You ever met guys that like tools, tool guys? You know, you back in the day when Sears used to have pretty good craftsman line, you know, guys used to like to go to Sears, and... You know, when you're there drooling over a tool, then you got there, next step comes another guy drooling over the same tool. And they start talking about what they have at home. All of a sudden, two guys that don't even know each other are talking about tools. And you know, tools are a tool, aren't they? To have a conversation with someone. And so if you're, you're a handyman, you're fitly joined into the body. Not to, you know, do maintenance around the church. That's fine. That's helpful. That, that helps the overall purpose. But, but the, bill, the church building, this building, is not the building. We're the building. And a handyman can be fitly joined right in. What's this guy here? He's, like Mr. Peabody. He's a nerd is what he is. And nerds fit under a lot of categories. A nerd could be an engineer. A nerd could be a computer science guy. A nerd could be... I'm picking up people today. <laughs> a, nerd, a nerd could work at a, uh, in a shop at Northern Tool. A nerd could uh, do a lot of things. But the reality of it is, is that, you know, nerds kind of geek out on stuff, don't they? You know, they get together and they like to get their little pocket protector and show their little nerd tools and uh, their gadgets. And they have things in common. The fact of the matter is nerds reach nerds. Okay. <laughs> Who's this guy? Yeah, he's a CPA. Well, that's, that's CPA here. Pastors part their hair down the side. CPA guys have wisp of hair going all directions because they organize they organize finances so much that they don't want to organize their hair, and so they their their organization goes into calculators and papers or whatever. But you know the kind of guys this guy reaches. He reaches the kind of guys that he comes into contact with, doesn't he? So he he reaches his customers and clients. And man, I'll tell you, a CPA has a lot of personal, private conversations with people about life. 
That is like a CPA. is not just a CPA. He's like a personal counselor. For a lot, I mean, really, a lot of times, uh, you just be amazed at how your job uh, is just put you in, in uh, contact with people uh, that you can uniquely reach. This guy, I think, is a trucker. I'm pretty sure that's a truck, <laughs> and uh, he's a truck driver. And truck drivers are another group of special breed. I couldn't find good truck driver clip art. I want a guy with a big pot belly because I think you're required to have a pot belly in order to be a good trucker. Now, there's skinny truckers, but you can't trust a skinny trucker. One, he hasn't eaten at enough rest stops. And two, uh, he can't possibly drive a truck very well without staring over a belly. Okay, uh, these people here, uh, these are non-gender specific uh, military people and so it's interesting here because there are five branches of the military and we're missing I think a branch of the military here like the Coast Guard nobody knows the Coast Guard's in the military so but uh, you know military people they just have an inside don't they to reach military people you can't tell a military person anything about anything unless you're military a lot of times I'll be having a great conversation with a marine and they'll say, you Marine? And I think it's a compliment when a Marine asks me if I'm a Marine. But then I'm like, no, I'm not a Marine. Oh, yeah. It's like, well, you're not a Marine. You know, why are you talking to me? If you don't know a Marine, you don't know anything about life and, and about blood, guts, and gore and that sort of thing. Uh, what kind of person is this? This is, this is a preacher. Yeah, yeah, it's a preacher. That's a pulpit. The pulpit was bending and so forth. He's a politician. Uh, yeah, or a politician. Yeah. <laughs> He could be a politician. <laughs> he, if you're a politician, he'd be hugging a baby. Preachers don't hug babies. Okay, moving forward. Uh, this is an athlete. And, uh, uh, you know, they, there's all types of athletes. Do you love my clip art? I didn't draw this myself. I stole most of this stuff. That's why it's not so good. These are presidents, uh, which are probably politicians. And so these are people that uh, did, they don't have eyes. They don't see anything. Right? So this is a servant. This is somebody washing somebody's feet. You know what I like about servants is anybody could be one of those. Anybody could serve someone. And I think that probably servants are the most effective soul winners. Uh, what can each of these different individuals have in common? Well, they can all be saved, can't they? You know, God just saves all kinds, all occupations, all kinds of people. And if they're saved, then each of them are automatically qualified to be what? Soul winners. Soul winners. Ding, 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 ding. Uh, yeah, so I stole a picture from Jeopardy and put a soul winner there. And this is the guy that got the wrong question, but he wrote, who is this handsome gentleman because he didn't have the right answer. And it's, it's funny. It's all over the Internet. I stole it and wrote the soul winner on it. He's probably not a soul winner, but he could be. He might be. I don't know. All right. Now, this is really where the rubber meets the road and where I would invite interaction from you here today. How to be a soul winner with your personality. So how can someone like me, you say, be a soul winner? And there's a little uh, little caption down below or a little line below there that says, Be part of the church. Listen to me. You may be a soul winner, but you won't be a good one unless you're part of a church. Let me illustrate that this way. I know people... Uh, there are, there are, I have Facebook friends that live in Broward County. I do not dispute that they love Jesus. They tell me all the time how much they do. I do not dispute that they are concerned about soul winning because they tell me all the time that they, that they strive to win souls. But they don't go to church. They're not part of a church. And they'll tell you what's wrong with all the churches and why they don't want to be part of the church, and why if they won somebody, they wouldn't want them to go to a church anyway. Because, you know, churches are messes, full of messy people, and all oh, the, these things. Here's a hang-up, though. Somebody's trying to tell you about Jesus, and even a lost person knows about the church. They just do. One of the things, when anytime as an ambiguous individual, I don't tell someone that I'm a pastor, I'm just talking to people. When I start talking about spiritual things, one of the first questions people have for me is, what church do you go to? Right. What kind of a church do you go to? Mm -hmm. What do you think a lost person thinks when you tell them that you don't have anything to do with any church? Mm -hmm. Throw some ideas, throw some thoughts out. What does a lost person think about a soul winner who wins souls without the church? 
You're following your own way to God. They think you've got your own religion. Can't really know what the guy believes by... You know, you can look up what Baptists believe, and you'll find wacky Baptists that believe all kinds of different things, but generally speaking, we're Baptists because of what we do believe. We believe in Bible authority, autonomy or independence of, the, of a local church. We believe in the priesthood of believers. We believe in individual atonement, saved church membership, two ordinances, baptism, one supper, and we believe in, uh, of course, the God, doctrine of the Trinity, the Godhead. So Baptists all believe that. What does a guy that's not involved with the church believe? Whatever he wants to. You don't really know. So, if you are converted to him, it's not part of a church, so if you're saved to be a part of whatever he isn't a part of, you're kind of like saved to be identified with him, right? Like, if you get led to the Lord, you're going to be what he is. He's not part of a church. So you, you're almost like a part of a cult. Almost like a part of it. Now, I, I, you say, Pastor, it's not like that. I know people that don't do it that way and so forth. Well, that's just the reality. That's the perspective that people have. It's church, Being part of a church is an important part of being a soul winner. Yes? You're also teaching them that you don't have any, anybody that you, that you submit to in terms of authority. Yeah, you're teaching yeah. them that you don't submit to authority. I'm my own authority. And it's, that is the key personality trait of a person that won't do soul winning through a church. He's got an authority problem. He won't be a member. He won't be fitly framed. He won't fit into anything. He's making his own way, and he's not belonging to anything. He's not part of what God is doing. Yeah, he's a, he's a rebel. That's part of it. You know, and, and you know, rebels win rebels. They do. I'm not saying you can't win people, but they'll be rebels <laughs> if you do. Anything else? Any other? What If a person is soul winning, but he's not part of the church? Disobedient. Yeah, he's disobedient. He's not what Jesus says he's supposed to be. Yeah, Melissa. He would be teaching them that you get to pick and choose what's true in the Bible. Yeah. What to believe and what not to, what's important and what isn't. It's just the same thing John is saying, but a different perspective on it. He's teaching that, you know, if, if the Bible, does the Bible teach that, that we're supposed to be members fitly framed, fitly joined mm -hmm. together in the church? Okay, so if a guy doesn't, how much authority does the Scripture have? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you don't have to do all the Bible. You don't have to believe everything in it. Well, then why should I believe the part you're telling me about salvation? It's either all true or it's none true. That's, it's an all or nothing book. It's everything. It's an all in kind of a thing. Now, I'm not preaching Lordship salvation here. I'm not saying you've got to be all in in order to be saved. It's got to be all Jesus. But the, the church is Christ's plan. And if you're not part of that plan, you're not going to be an effective soul learner. Here's the deal. I'm not, I'm not bashing. I'm not picking on. I'm just saying... We want to be optimized, right, as individuals. We want to understand why people aren't effective in winning souls. And one of the major keys of people that are effective winning souls, and one of the major aspects of a person that's ineffective, is that a person who wins a lot of souls is really involved with God's plan in the church. Now, when you lead someone to Christ, you're responsible to teach them to observe all things. Aren't you? The Bible doesn't say, you know, go and and preach the gospel. There's a, there are, it's a group right now that are soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, and they hate the idea of follow-up. They just do not want to do follow-up. There's other guys that just want to do follow-up and they don't want to do soul winning. But it's, an all, it's a cohesive plan. And it's a teamwork kind of a thing. In other words, you're the person that's going to most effectively disciple a person that God has you lead to the Lord. But you can't take them all the way without the church. You need the church. I mean, think how much help it is for somebody you're doing a purple bu purple Bible study a personal I looked at Anthony and the word got replaced on me All right, a, a personal Bible study with and when you do a personal Bible study with them isn't it great when you take them to church and they hear the message preached of what you just studied and let me ask you a question what's usually the convincer the Bible study or the preaching it's usually the preaching it's usually the preaching of the Word of God because the Holy Spirit of God takes the foolishness of preaching, uses it to save them that believe, and it just he can, it's a convincer. It's just something that God uses. It's unique. There's nothing like it. So be part of the church. All right? Um, the church is God's soul-winning program. Here is a less artistic rendering of soul winners. And, you know, I'm just tragic. I'm just sad how tragic it is that they can't even get differences in sizes 
in the soul winners. But it is what it is, and uh, there it is. So here's a. I just I want to just tell you I'm embarrassed about this and the lack of creativity in it. <laughs> but let's look at the caption. That's the main thing. The church is God's soul winning program. The more involved you are in a soul winning church, the more individuals you'll win. Your effectiveness in soul winning is proportionate to your involvement in the church. Let me illustrate it this way. How many people do Sunday school teachers lead to the Lord? More than anybody else. Right? Uh, and of course there are better groups to be a Sunday school. But, but any of them. Any group. I, I, a Sunday school teacher will win more people you say, Pastor, where's the Sunday school in the Bible? Well, it's the teaching them to observe all things part. Teaching them to observe all things part. And I just tell you, a teacher is going to win more people than a person who doesn't teach. <clears throat> you say, Pastor, am I supposed to be a soul winning, or am I supposed to be a Sunday school teacher? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you are. Uh, no, seriously. You know, church workers... When we talk about church workers, we're not talking about the people that do the maintenance around the place. We're talking about the people that do the work of the ministry. And there are Sunday school classes or even topics that you're uniquely equipped to teach. They're just, they're just topics that, that when we teach that topic, you're going to be the person to teach it. There are groups that you're going to be the person to teach. You know, probably pastor's not going to teach the toddlers. Some of you have like this special uh, toddler like you think they're human and all that. like you, you can relate you know uh, but you just you know you can you can just teach age so yeah I, just just common sense right you get to be part of the plan the church and I'm talking about the local body and the work the body does what's the body do we preach the gospel we teach them to observe all things and uh, we and we baptize. That's what the body does, and that's a team effort. And the more involved you are as part of the team, the more people you'll lead to Jesus. Pastor, don't you know a lot? You know, I, there's this whole well, people are supposed to get saved outside of the church. The church is saved. You know, the church is for saved people. You, you, you know that that mm -hmm. mindset. Don't try to preach the gospel in the church. The gospel is supposed to be preached out of the church, and we're supposed to teach in the church. Well, the reality of it is, if anybody ever wants to know what in the world a believer is, the best place to go find out is church. And when they come and they see what it's all about, that's when they're convinced and they're one. The church is the best place. The church is the best uh, place to go out of to preach the gospel, and the church is the best place uh, to see people saved. We have more people saved at church events and uh church and church services than we do outside of church. Why? Is that bad? No. But you, you knock on doors and encounter a stranger, and I'll just be honest with you, if, if you give a two-minute or ten-minute presentation of the gospel and somebody, uh, and somebody gets saved, hear me now, almost every single time it'll be because of the work that a church has already done before you got there. If they know who Jesus is, it's because the church has done some teaching. If they know the the story of uh, the account of Bible account of creation, it's because the church has done some teaching. If they know about the virgin birth, it's because the church has done some teaching. Whereas if they got saved, you knocked on their door and you led them to to Christ in two or three minutes, it's because they already knew who Jesus was, mm -hmm. who God was, and they already knew some things that it's the job of the church to teach. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. So this whole, we don't need the church to do soul winning mindset. No, my friend, the church is where it gets done. And the more you partner up, the more you team up, the more uh, you get in sync with the church, the more you'll win people to Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. It ought to be a no-brainer, but it isn't. Because I don't know why I'm not a very effective soul winner. Well, you're not a very effective church member either. Isn't it interesting, the correlation? Okay, uh, whoops, went the wrong way. How to be a soul winner with your personality. <laughs> now, I told you last week, we're going to talk about how to be a soul winner with your unique one 
in 7.7 .7 billionth personality be part of the church. Be part of the church. Again, you say, Pastor, I was really hoping today you're going to give me like something I could memorize that when I say it, or a list of answers when people tell me something that I can answer. And that was going to make me really good at soul winning. I want to tell you the secret to being really good at soul winning. Be part of the church. Just telling you. I, that's what's made me better at soul winning is being part of the church. You take my involvement with the church out and I lose credibility, I lose effectiveness, I lose, I, I lose all of the extras that I bring in. Uh, and without the church, I'm not an effective soul winner. Okay, that's what... Whoops, we're going the wrong way again, I guess. Um, the more involved you are in a soul winning church, the more individuals you'll win. I thought it would be a good idea to go ahead and qualify what we're saying. If your church doesn't care about winning souls, you're not going to be more effective at winning souls in that church. Does that make sense? Lord, you might be a soul winner in a non-soul winning church. And the church... That, there are churches that just aren't trying to grow through soul winning. They're trying to grow through programs. They're trying to uh, be the best church. And what they define church as is a body that is assembled together for fellowship and edification. You ever heard that definition of a church? A church is for fellowship and for edification. Well, edification is building up the body, and fellowship's a fine thing. But my friend, the church is God's plan for carrying out the Great Commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to deserve all things. Is there fellowship in the church? Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely, it's teamwork. Is there edification in the church? There better be or it won't be a good church. But that isn't what a church does. And many times a church uh, tries to have the best facilities. They try to have the best music. They try to have the best entertainment. Uh, and what their goal is, listen to me, what their goal is, and I know because I sit down with guys that state their goals and tell me how to grow the organization this way. I know what they believe. And what they believe is that a successful church attracts people, oftentimes to the detriment of other churches which are less successful. In other words, it's kind of a competition. We're going to have the best, and when people look around and decide where they're going to go, they're going to come to us because we've got the best program, we've got the best facility, we've got the best music, we've got the... We're run the best. We're doing a great job. But soul winning isn't what they're concerned about doing a great job of. Uh, it always hurts my feelings when people move to town and they're already saved. And they stop in because they found us on the internet. And they come to our church and first of all they kind of inspect our building and like, eh, eh. you know, that's not really a church. And then they come in and they, you know, kind of look around and they inspect our people and like, eh, eh. <laughs> And then they, um, they uh, looked at the pastor. It doesn't bother me. I understand their perspective on this one. They're kind of like, yeah. You know? And then they go, and I, I follow up on it. They say, yeah, we went to another Baptist church, and we joined there. And I'll oftentimes ask the reason why. And they'll say, well, you know, they really had a good, uh, you know, they, they really have a good, they'll always talk about programs, and they'll talk about things that aren't soul winning or serving God. And what I realize is that the churches are just doing a lot better job with programming than we are. And that's just the way it is. It's just, you know, you can only be so good. I, I wish we were the best at everything. We're just not. But you know what I want to be good at? I want to be good at reaching people that no one else will reach. In other words, if somebody moves to town, they're already saved and they go to another church. It's not the end of the world. But if somebody lives in our community and they never hear the gospel and get saved, that's a problem. That's what we need to be as a church. We need to be the people that are reaching people that aren't just going to go to the best one. Mm -hmm. They're going to they're going to be won by people. And by the way, when you get saved in a church, is there a better church than that one? The church that you got saved in it just isn't a better one, is there? You know, I mean, I understand people change, things change, but there's just a special place in your heart for that. How to be a soul winner with your personality, be part of the church. The more involved you are in a soul winning church, the more individuals you'll win. And the church has got soul winning program. When a believer is involved in the church, people will notice. Now, I asked the question earlier, what do people think when someone shares the gospel, but they don't go to church? Well, they think a lot of things about you, actually, when you don't. What do people think when a person doesn't really say anything about it, but he's so heavily involved in his church, it's really evident? My neighbors that don't know me. Because we live in a neighborhood. 
that I drive through and I wave at people, my neighbors that don't know me know that I'm a Christian. When Melissa and I lived in a condo, you know, you got condo gossips, and you can't even meet them all. Some people are afraid to meet you because of what they said about you. Anyway, but when we lived in a condo, 100% of the people in our condo knew we were Christians. Knew I was a pastor. They knew everything about me. Why? Well, because what I do evidently shows that I'm a Christian. And it's not even anything I say or do. I'm not preaching lifestyle evangelism here, but it's an, it, our testimony is an important aspect of, of our soul winning. Uh, when you're involved in church, believers will notice. Your friend calls you, hey, you want to go fishing on Sunday? You know, Sunday I go to church. Do you know that that's a pretty good testimony to them? In other words, you're not saying anything other than church is a priority in my life, but you're saying volumes by that. You know, so many Christians, their family says, we want to have a get-together. Uh, you know, we're going to get together on Easter, and we're going to have a family dinner. I, I cry inside when people don't come to church on Easter because they're going to family dinners. It just it breaks my heart. I just think, oh, you're one opportunity to tell your family how much Jesus means to you, how important the church is. You're one opportunity to do that, and you tell them the opposite by what you do. Right? Uh, I cry inside when people go on vacation and don't go on go don't go to church. Why? You're one opportunity. When somebody shows up at church on their vacation, you know what it tells me? This is really important in my life. It's really important in my life. You know what it tells people when you don't? It's not really important in my life. And that testimony is ginormous. There's accountability in going uh, to church. The greatest mental obstacle to overcome when you're preaching the gospel to your friends and family, it's our testimony. Being part of a church body in a public way gives accountability to help our testimony. You got saved and you have some habits. You think you say things you shouldn't say. And you tell your friends, I'm saved. I go to church. And then you drop something. You say something. And your saved friends go, oh, you're supposed to be saved. You're supposed to go to church. Lost people provide better accountability for a Christian than saved people do. Do you hear me? When you're concerned about winning your, your lost friend, mm -hmm. your testimony, they help you with your testimony. You'd be amazed at how you'll overcome a bad habit like cursing or swearing or mm -hmm. saying things you shouldn't say by just letting your friends know, I go to church. They know. I mean, when your neighbors know, oh, he's a church guy, well, you better not lose your temper with them. In other words, you'll behave better and you'll be a better testimony for your lost people by being part of a church. It makes sense, doesn't it? It just it makes an enormous amount of sense. Oh, that pastor. Oh, that Christian. You know, I mean, I don't want people saying things about me and saying he's supposed to be a Christian. Do you? And it just helps me to be careful about what I say or do because I am a Christian, because I'm out in the open about it. You ever think of what it must have been like to be part of that group of people in Acts 2? On the day of Pentecost, when the gospel was preached in great power, and they were pricked to their hearts. And I can imagine, you know, the Bible says, you know, when they heard this, they were pricked to their hearts and said, Men and brethren, these are the people that crucified Jesus. They said, What shall we do? And I can imagine them thinking, You know what? We crucified Jesus. We're doomed. What can we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. And they did and in public, in front of all of the people that scoffed and railed on and cried, crucify him, they went down to the river and got baptized. In front of everybody. Do you think that might have been a galvanizing event, that baptism? Do you think that might have said, here I stand? I am identified with Jesus? I mean, they identified themselves. And friend... If you go to a church that you're embarrassed to be a part of, you better get in a, in a good church that's not embarrassing to be a part of. You see, does that make sense? I'm not trying to... If you're embarrassed to be part of this church, I hope you come and tell me why. And I hope we can fix whatever it is. But, you know, you ought to be just, these are my people. This is my body. This is who I am. 
and just identify. And when you identify, you will become more effective as a soul winner. Hear me. One of the major hang-ups in soul winning is believers not being an open vocal part of the church. Okay, I just touched the button. I didn't do anything. Okay. Uh, discussion time. Uh, I want to talk about. <laughs> I want to talk about uh, at this time a couple a couple of important things, and uh, the first one we really are pretty well out of time today, and so I want to first of all summarize. Did my oh I did I hit myself. I want to summarize what we said today. And first of all, I want to summarize what we said last week. Last week, you could summarize our entire lesson, and it was very succinct. And I, I want it to be as succinct this week. I don't think I've done as good a job of that. Last week, what did we learn? A person who's saved is a soul winner. In other words, in order to be a soul winner, you need to be saved. And if you're saved, then you're called. That's what we learned last week. So last week, one of the things that we wanted to get past was the notion that you have to be a certain type of person in order to be a soul winner. I want you to know you're the type of person that you need to be in order to be a soul winner. Does everybody get that? In other words, you're a soul winner because you're saved. That's why. You're a good soul winner because you're saved. You're an effective soul winner because you're saved. This week, I wanted you to understand what. I hope somebody can tell me. What do we talk a lot about today? Church. The church. Yeah, the church. Most people are not effective soul winners because they're not a part of the church. They don't do soul winning as part of the church. They see it as, there really is, and from a pastor's perspective, there's a real juxtaposition in this area. There's like there's this divide where people are against being part of the church's soul winning plan. Now, how many people say, Pastor, I'll be a soul winner, but I'm not going to come out when you guys do visitation, right? You know, I, I don't really agree with the way you guys are, you know, that, that event that you're doing, that's just not how I think it should, that people should be reached. Well, it's just people all the time. Well, you know, I do soul winning my way. And when they say that, what I usually think is, what you really mean is I don't do soul winning. That's usually what it means. But what I think about you is that knowing what I know about Christ's church and what the Bible says about the church and soul winning, I bet you're not very good at it. I bet you're not very good at soul winning without the church. You hear me? See, soul winning's not hard. Winning lost people isn't complicated. It isn't a matter of genius, brilliance, presentation, personality, you know, unique gifts. It's a matter of getting with the program. And you know, a lot of believers aren't part of the program. They want to do it their way. You just can't do it better than Jesus. You know, if I were to say I'm smarter than God, how many of you would, you know, kind of duck? <laughs> I'd be like, uh-oh, <laughs> he's in trouble. Yeah. Uh, then what do you think you're saying when God lays out the philosophy for soul winning and you don't think it's a good one? Why do you think we're not good at it? Soul winning effectiveness is predicated on your involvement with Christ's plan the church. You'll never be an effective soul winner if you think that you're not called. And you have to be saved to be called, but if you're saved, you're called. Secondly, you'll never be an effective soul winner if you're not part of God's plan. And I, I just use some... I mean, I know it could be said so much better than I've said it. It could be illustrated so many more times than I've illustrated. But I just used some simple things today to try to convince you that Christ's plan for soul winning is the church. That's what we said today. Christ's plan for soul winning is the church. And so if you want to be effective at it, how many of you can be involved in the church? We all can, can't we? Hey, we have open membership here. If you're born again, you're in fellowship with God, you've been scripturally baptized, you can join this church. You can be a member. And you know something? We want you to serve. We want you to plug in and get involved to the greatest extent that God will allow you. There's no limitation. There's no, well, you can't be, 
you know, you're, re you're a restricted member. <laughs> there aren't any restrictions. <clears throat> so the question then is, if you want to be effective, how do you do it? Well, you get past some obstacles. The mindset that I can't, or this is what a soul winner looks like. And you come to the place where you say, the person in the mirror is the person that can win souls like no one else. That's the way God planned it. Listen, you don't need to be a different person than you are. You need to be the person God created you to be. You're a special kind of soul winner. And don't I know it. Man, there are just people in the church that just win people. And I'm just like, I can never do that. I'm just the pastor. I can't win souls like they can. Seriously, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm not a pastor. I don't like... No, I, a lot of times I look at, when I see an effective soul winner, I say, you know, I'm just a pastor. So now I wish I could be that person. <laughs> not really. I'm glad to be the person God made me to be. But if you just understand that you can win the people that are around you, but that the key to unlocking effectiveness is being part of the church. You will have gotten past an obstacle, a barrier, that most people are stumbling at and never even know what it is. They don't even know, why am I not effective? Well, because you're missing an important key and you just can't be effective doing it your own way and not God's way. And it just makes it renders so many people ineffective. I know people that do their own thing regularly, religiously, and they just don't get much done. And they work harder at it than anyone else. And the reason is because they are overlooking God's plan. Okay? All right. Yes? This thing, one of the things we really need in the local church, and this is what you've been doing to us today, exhorting one another, Hebrews 10.25, mm. one of the purposes of the church. Expound on that. I, some people don't know what exhort Not means. Not forsaking the assembling of, your, of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You're encouraging us to be soul winners within the church. Isn't and it special to, to get together and do something that's kind of a Sunday school thing on a mm -hmm. Saturday? I mean, I'm, 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 I'm motivated by, by this. That's this, Hebrews 10.25. Hebrews 10.25. Oh. Okay. <clears throat> I guess you could say encouraging too. That's part of part yeah. of exhorting is encouraging. Listen, I want to lift you up. I'm not here to tear someone down and say, "Oh, you, you know, yeah, okay, yeah, you're probably not going to be a very good soul winner." You know, you are. You are. You can be, but you have to do it God's way, and you have to think God's way of thinking. Okay, I, I did. I wanted to take comments or questions. That book, The Soul Winner's Fire by John Rice. It's a good, good resource. Extremely, yes. And he emphasized a lot about being spirit-filled and a lot about the heart towards soul winning. And that's something we've kind of bypassed. By that, I don't mean we don't think it's important. I mean, we just haven't covered that. That hasn't been covered. But that, that is a good resource. The Soul Winner's Fire by John R. Rice. It's, uh, it's, I don't even know if it's in print anymore. It probably is. But there are so many. If you go on Amazon... They're, they're cheap copies, two, three dollars, six dollars. They're not very expensive. Uh, but John Rice was one of the great soul winners of the past century. And was, if you ever go online and watch a, a sermon of John Rice, he, he was so greatly used of God that if you never looked at his personality or methods, you'd think he would, must have been just this brilliant, dynamic personality. And actually, he was kind of, I guess, a little flat personality-wise, and won hundreds of thousands of people to Jesus and because of understanding the, the importance of, of God's plan and His power. Okay? What else? Anyone else have a comment or question? I think I saw another hand for a question or comment. Somebody? Pastor, you've gone way too long, and we're tired, and I can tell. I can tell you. It's rough this morning. All right. Anything? Thoughts? Comments. I didn't get any um, written feedback about things that you hope I'll cover. Next week, I want to cover how to present the gospel in simplicity. Yes, Angela. Are we going to have 
Not next week. Next week. week next week's the fellowship, right? And ladies retreat and fellowship. Yes. Ladies retreat and fellowship. And then the is the week after the week we're going to. Yeah. We're going for the teen trip. Yeah. So the, I'm not going to teach that class. Won't be having that class. So the 16th, February 16th is our next one. Okay. Uh, so February 16th is our next is our next class get together. I encourage you. Come next Saturday evening to the fellowship. We're going to have soul winning scenarios. So if you want a scenario, uh, it'll help me to prepare for it. If you'll say, Pastor, I was sharing the gospel with somebody and they said this. Or how do you bring up the gospel with somebody with this, like uh, this person I want to share the gospel with? How do I do it? And we'll do a, an impromptu. Uh, well, we could be more prepared if you'll give it to me ahead of time. Okay, you could be a question like, you know, I, I, I work in a secular environment. We're not supposed to talk about religious things. You know, what, whatever your scenario is, whatever your question is, will you please give it to me? And next Saturday evening, we'll have fellowship and game night. But I, but one of the things we're going to do is we're going to have soul winning scenarios. So it'll it'll be fun. It'll actually be a really good time. But that'll be next Saturday night. So that'll that's at five thirty, right, Melissa? Mm -hmm. 5.30, Saturday evening, and that's our normal monthly uh, fellowship and game night. We just want to incorporate what we're doing into that as well. All right. Let's dismiss. Father, it is a privilege to be called to be part of your plan, and we really are overawed that simple folks like me can be involved with this. Thank you so much for the privilege of being a soul winner. God, help me to get beyond myself, to get over myself, and just be who I'm supposed to be so that I can be effectively used. And I pray that for our church. I pray that we would just get past some barriers. The barrier of not understanding that we're called, being sure about that. The barrier of not being part of your plan, which is the church, and being involved with that. God, the, the, all these barriers that we seem like we're not aware of it, but we're, we're just running into and not effective because of it. And I pray that you would help us to be more effective. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.